Joe Martin, Casey Wertheim, Detective uh, Chris Johnson, possibly, and Detective Tim Doe for this morning. And this afternoon, we only have two witnesses right now, Stacy Smalls and um, Detective Raphael Crenshaw. So um, depending on what time we have, there are a few additional pretrial issues we can also address during some of that gap time as well, but we'll wait and get out. So I'm just going to also see uh, Casey Johnson. He probably, well, he made it this afternoon, we're not sure that may have to get moved as a result of, of some of the scheduling issues. So if it happens, he made this afternoon, but he may not be till tomorrow. And there was a video. We can't play that because it, it can't play until the foundation court is laid by the DNA expert because it was another DNA person. So that unfortunately can't play until the DNA person is able to get back here from Canada, which we expect to be on Wednesday at this point. Your Honor, just a request for a subpoena duke is taken to be signed by the court, which uh, we'd appreciate given the fact that we're asking for medical records of Miss Peets. I can explain more about it anyway. I've served a copy on the state, and uh, I'll pass it up to Your Honor. We'd like the date to be set for October 4th uh, for the records to be produced. that we spoke to the Poly Clinic, which is the place that has the records on Friday, attempting to get more information on how they can get these records. And, and I told Mr. Allen, I, I think they're going to also want a medical really sign by his plant, but I will defer to Mr. Allen on how he wants to handle that. But they said they could get the records relatively quickly once they got the stuff they needed. Thank you, Your Honor. And with the court's permission, I'll have the state sign off on copy received. No, Your Honor.
call your next witness. Thank you. That's correct. And in the course of that search, um, did you remove certain items for testing for DNA or fingerprints? Yes, I did. When you remove those items, what did you do with them? All the evidence that I collected at the scene was packaged and uh, placed into our evidence room. Um, specifically with the items from the car, did you collect something that you numbered AAM0088? Yes. And what was that? Those were uh, swabs that I had received from the State Patrol crime lab people. Okay. And those were swabs taken in the car? Yes. They Throughout the search, they took swabbings at different areas of the car. And at the end of the search, they give them to me so I can put them into evidence. Okay. And how did you do that um, with the various different swabs? How many were there? I don't recall exactly. Okay. Um, 12 sound yeah. approximate? Yeah. How, did, how did you package those? Probably put them in one box or envelope. Okay. Did you put the swabs in separate boxes to keep them separate from each other? They were all given to me separately, yes. Okay. Then with regard to other items in the car, did you process or collect something that you numbered AAM54? Yes. And do you recall what that was? Is that the flashlight? That's the flashlight. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and something numbered AAM 59? Yes, I know I collected up to 90 items. So okay, <laughs> okay. Um, plastic bottle, does yes. that sound familiar? Um, AAM 60, plastic bag? Yes. AAM 64, a CD case? Yes. And we previously interviewed AAM 95, Yes. That was actually removed from the car. Yes. Okay. Not that day. Later on. Later on. And item A A M eighty one X rays. Yes. Do you remember where those were in the car? They were on the uh, front passenger floorboard. Okay. And you said that you collected some 90 items, is that right? Well, there's 24, I think, at the original scene, and then so from 20, they never see sequentially, so okay. 25 through 90 something, I believe, from the okay. vehicle search. Can you just give us a sort of a general idea, other than the things we just talked about, what sorts of things were you finding in the car? Uh, we took almost everything out of the car, magazines, clothing, shoes, okay. various items. And were all those items submitted to the lab for testing of one kind or another? I don't believe all of them are. Okay. So how do you go about selecting what looks like it might be worth testing? Well, this one was nice because we had crime lab people actually at the scene with me. So they would tell me which ones they wanted to additional testing on. Okay. And did you then provide those to the lab for testing? Yes, I did. I'd also like to go back to the actual scene where Nicole's body was found down in Burien. Yes. Um, did you take swabs or package swabs that have been taken off her body? Yes. How do you go about taking a swab to keep it sterile or unadulterated when you're I, doing something like that? Purchase the swab. I didn't take the sample. Okay. When you have done it before, how do you typically do it? You usually use uh, distilled water a little bit to dampen it, and then you uh, swab the area you want to 
collect. Okay. And then they have little envelopes of plastic tubes they go in. Okay. And did you um, package a swab AAM 11, which was from her right shoulder? Yes. And AAM 12, which was her left hand? Yes. AAM 13, which was her left bicep? Yes. AAM 24, which was her left thigh? Yes. Okay, and tell us about that. Did that start out as a different number? I started off as 12. Okay, so I, you... I, I inadvertently, I, I, number two item was 12, and when another detective was going through it, she pointed that out to me, so I had to resubmit one as 24. Okay. And then AAM 88, we've talked about were the swabs from the car, yep. right? And at some point, did you actually check those swabs out from the evidence unit? I did. And what did you do with them? Um, the state crime lab person that was working on DNA needed those swabs, so I went over to the property management unit, checked them out there, and then took them back over to the crime lab and hand delivered them. Okay. Tell us about the property management unit. What is that exactly? It's a warehouse down in South Seattle where we keep all our evidence. And when you package something up, and we've talked about sealing it and that sort of thing, is that where it goes? Yes. And then it's held securely there until it's tested? That's correct. I wanted to ask you about a couple other things that were in the car. Um, one being a Good Guys parking pass. Yes. Okay. And that's Good Guys what? Computer store? Yes. It's, I think they might be out of business now, but yes, it's a computer store. Okay. At some point, did you learn the significance of that or why it would be in the car? Um, I made a lot of phone calls in this, contacting people that were on uh, Nicole's cell phone list, and one of them happened to be a girl that her boyfriend worked with David at uh, Good Guys. Okay. Is there anything that she asked you to actually remove or that you decided to remove for some reason other than the gear shift later? Uh, both the uh, interior locks from the uh, driver's side doors were taken. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's in Lock States Exhibit 76. Uh, 54. I'm sorry, 54. It's a Yes. <laughs> Purport to be. It's the door handle, driver door handle, interior side. Okay. Is that one of the things that you removed that day? Yes. Okay. Could I ask you to, well, actually, first of all, I'm going to offer, I'm sorry, 54? 54. It says 76. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Your number. Right. Okay. So could you, um, I'm sorry. Thank you. Could you open that, please, and look inside and show us what it is? Do you want me to actually remove this? Yeah. Could you hold it up and, okay. Yeah, it's okay. the, yeah, inside of the driver's door where the, Laps comes. Okay. So that's where somebody pulls to yes. open the door? Yes, pulls to open the door from the inside. Okay. And which door was that on? This is the driver's door. Okay. Okay. If I get up just a moment. Ninety items that you took from the car that you took into evidence. I was up to ninety at the end of that, but there was twenty-four at the original scene. So okay, that's right. Um, and you told us, I think, earlier when you testified that there was a, a number of sports equipment items that you found in the car. Yes. Uh, some baseballs. 
Is that oh, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, golf balls. Yes. Uh, there was also a 24-hour fitness coupon. I think, yeah, a couple different of those. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, was there an empty drink bottle as well? Yes, I believe so. I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. Nothing else. Thank you. Are we, are we now finished with this witness? Yes. Are you gonna call, you're not going to recall him? All right. You're still under subpoena. Raise your right hand, please. You swear or affirm your testimony in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes. You see the truth. Good morning. Good morning. Could you tell us your name and spell your last name for the record? My name is Cynthia Zeller, Z-E-L-L-E-R. And what is your occupation? I work as a latent print examiner. What's a latent print examiner? Um, what I do is I compare fingerprints and I also process crime scenes for fingerprints and I process uh, evidence for fingerprints. Um, which agency do you work for? I work for the King County Sheriff's Office, King County Regional APHIS. And what is APHIS? APHIS is um, the section that I work for and APHIS is also our computer system. How long have you worked um, in this field? I've worked in this field for approximately 25 years. I've worked as a legal <coughs> examiner for 17. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about your background and training that qualifies you in this area? Okay. Uh, for my formal education, I received a Bachelor of Criminal Justice from Seattle University. <laughs> okay, for my formal education, I received a Bachelor of Criminal Justice from Seattle University. Um, as I said, I've worked in the field for 25 years. For three years, I worked as a uh, can't remember the name, technical service specialist. Um, basically, that was a uh, administration administrative position, clerical position. Then, for five years, I worked as an identification technician, where I compared known prints to known prints. And I, when I got hired on as an identification technician, I spent the first six months and on the job training. Then, for the last 17 years, I've been a latent print examiner. And when I started as a late print examiner, I spent 15 months on the job training. In addition to that, I have spent um, over 850 hours in educational training, classes, workshops, and conferences, learning all aspects of my job. And then I'm also, uh, for the last four years, I've been the uh, lead trainer in my office. And I currently have four trainees that I am assisting. And finally, I have been certified as a, a certified as a late input examiner through the International Association for Identification. Okay. Um, now you talked about known prints. What's a known print? A known print is the reproduction of the friction skin. And on the underside of your hands and the bottom of your feet is raised skin. Um, that raised skin is known as ridges, and then there's depressions between the ridges, and those are known as furrow. So what a known print is, is the reproduction of those friction skin made on purpose for some sort of record of a known individual in a controlled situation. Okay. So in other words, somebody's fingerprints are taken and you know whose prints they are. Yes. Okay. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about fingerprints in general? I am going to ask you to slow down just a touch. You have the same malady that I do. Um, can you tell us, are all fingerprints unique? Uh, yes, they are. Okay. Tell us, um, if you would, and if it would help you to have an exhibit. Um, can you tell us how fingerprints work or what it is about them that makes them unique? Um, I do have an exhibit that I'd like to use. Can I please get it for me and I'll show it to that they are formed uh, in the womb by the 12th month of gestation, a uh, 12th week, I'm sorry, 12th week of gestation, um, and that's when the the, uh, the pattern or the, the blueprint for the fingerprint is formed. Um, it's formed and it is persistent throughout one's life, uh, barring injury or scarring, um, and it remains that way until decomposition happens after death. And it's unique because as it's being formed, as that blueprint is being formed, there are many different factors that um, form it, such as uh, the genetics of a person, the diet of the mother, uh, if she's taking any medication, and the stresses and the pressures in the womb. Uh, so that's what makes the print both permanent and unique. So when we're looking at a fingerprint, we're going to analyze it to see what information is available. And this is just a generic chart here that I have to kind of help you see some of the information that we have in the print. Would you mind standing up with the chart? It's a little difficult to see. Thank you. Okay. Sure. We're <coughs> okay. So when we look for a print, when we're going to analyze the print, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to analyze the print, and we're going to look for the various uh, information that is available. So we're going to look for different levels of detail. All right. Okay, so for the first level of detail. Your Honor, we can't see it from here. makes a wave or a rise, and then flows back out the opposite side. So that's your level one detail, and it kind of helps you narrow your search for where you're going to look. Then we have level two detail, which most people refer to as points. And probably a lot of people have heard points or minutia. And so what those are are there's a ridge that's flowing along, and then it stops. That's called an ending ridge. And that's what it looks like. Or you have a ridge that's flowing along, and then it divides into two. So here you have this ridge that's flowing, it divides into two. Mm -hmm. um, people call that either a dividing ridge or a bifurcation. And then finally we have something called a short ridge, which is pretty self-explanatory. It starts and ends very short. So that's our level two detail that we have. And then we have something called level three detail, which is more minute or more small detail. We have things that are called incipient ridges, and those are ridges that were not fully formed when they were being developed. So what an incipient is missing is a pore in it. So most ridges have pores in them. So this is an incipient ridge. You can see it's between the two ridges, and it's here, it's here, it's here. Then we also have pores. They're also a third level detail. And you can see on this ridge here, there's this space. That's where the pore of the, the ridge is, and that's where your sweats and oils come out. And then the third level, or then the last level, or last detail that we have, is known as um, the ridge shape itself. So most of the time you think that a ridge is just flowing nice and smooth, but actually a lot of times it has shapes and contours in it that help you to uh, determine what information is there or to give you more weight to your conclusion. So we use all of this detail um, when we're making a, an analysis. We gather this, all this information together to determine whether or not we have enough information that we can move forward to the comparison stage. So once we get to the comparison stage, we take this information that we've gathered 
from all of this, and we're going to look at the latent print against the known print. And we're going to look at these two prints side by side, and we're going to be looking for a series of detail in one, and we're going to look to the other one to see if we can find it in there. Okay, let's back up with the latent print. A latent print is a chance impression. It's um, if on your friction ridges you have some sort of transfer medium, the sweats and oils from your pores, um, if you've just been eating some food and you have some sort of oil on it, uh, from like a potato chip or something, um, and you touch an object, you may leave a print behind. Um, it's a chance impression because a lot of times we don't leave prints behind. Okay, so you're comparing that chance impression against the one that you know who made it, right? Yes, yeah, so we're comparing the latent print, which is the chance impression, against a known print, which was made on purpose. Okay, and when detectives are taking prints from a crime scene or a car or something like that, is that a latent print that they're taking? Yes. So those are chance impressions? Yes, they are. And you're comparing it to a print that you know who it belongs to? Yes. Okay. Do you want to see? Is there anything left on this? Uh, this I don't need anything more from that. Okay, I'll let you take that back then. Okay. So you said sometimes we don't leave prints behind. Why would that be? Um, there's many factors when we leave a print behind. Uh, first, we'll start with the skin. If you don't have a transfer medium on your hand, sorry, I'm talking fast. If you don't have a transfer medium on your hand, you may not leave a print behind. If you have dry skin or if you have oily skin, maybe you have So when you touch the object, all you get is a blob or a smear. Uh, so what's happening with the skin? Also, age can be a factor. If you have a young child, they're not sweating yet. They haven't reached puberty, they're not sweating, so they might not leave a print behind. Um, if you just washed your hands, you may not have anything on your hands. So the first factor is the skin. Then there's the object you're touching. Is it a clean object? Is it dirty? Is it textured? Is it smooth? Um, does it have a curve verger to it? So you, you have all this information there. So if you have a textured, dirty object, it might be more difficult to leave a print behind than if you have something that's smooth and clean. Then there's how the print was left behind. If you grab something, you may or may not leave a print behind. Um, think about when you grab a doorknob. As you grab that doorknob, you're using a lot of pressure to turn, so you could actually wipe the print away as you're putting it on there. So how it was left behind, or what happens to it after somebody touches something. So you touch that doorknob, and you leave a nice print behind, but then somebody comes along after you, and they grab it really tight and wipe everything off. So what happens to it afterwards? Then there's also the environmental factors that happen. If you leave a print out in the sun, it's on a car, you leave it in the sun, if the sun is shining on it, it can actually dry out the print because most prints are made from sweats and oils and sweat is made up mostly of water and if it's in the sunshine, it can dry out. Uh, so, and if it's in the rain, it can actually be washed away. If you're in an air-conditioned room and the air is hitting it, again, it can dry it out. Um, so these factors come into play. And then there's what happens once somebody either tries to collect it or preserve it. So somebody tries to powder the print, maybe they use too hard of a brush and they wipe the print away or destroy it. Um, they can also put it in the packaging and they don't package it well, so it's moving around inside the package and it actually gets wiped off. So all these factors come into play when you may leave a print behind, and if you do leave a print behind, if it, it will actually be there when you go to process it. Okay, so the powder that you've indicated, is that when you're trying to lift a latent print? Yes. And how does that work exactly? Um, basically, we take a brush, and it's a fiberglass brush, you dip it in a little bit of powder, you take it on and shake it a little bit <coughs> so there's not too much powder on it, and then you just start brushing the area that you want to see if you can develop a latent print. And then what happens if the exam if the person sees something that looks like a print, what do they do then? Um, if you see something that looks like a print uh, and you don't think you need to powder it anymore, you take lift tape and you put the lift tape down and then pull the lift tape up and put it on the card. Um, if you're afraid that you might not be able to lift it, you can take a photograph of it first, try and photograph that print. Uh, sometimes if the contrast isn't good, maybe you have a black car with a black powder on it and you can see it, but it's not a real good contrast, you're probably going to want to do the lift tape versus photograph. So. so the lift tape is actually lifting the powder, the pattern that the powder delineated, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, in what situation might a photo be taken instead of a print lifted? Um, well, if you 
use certain processes. Uh, for example, if you use superglue, which is called cyanacrylate ester, which we commonly call superglue or CA, um, that's when we take this chemical and we fume it, and then the fume um, adheres to residue, and then we see a white residue left behind. Uh, that's not something that you can lift, so you'd have to take a photograph of that. Do members of your unit go to crime scenes? Yes. And why do you do that? Um, we go to crime scenes because we've been requested to. And what is it that you're to do there? Um, we're there to process the scenes for latent prints. How do you decide what to lift or test or photograph when you're at a scene? And there's so much there. I, well, we'll talk with the detectives and they'll tell us um, this room was touched, so process this room, and then we'll look at that room to see what items we can process. Uh, if you go in and there's a textured wall, you might not be able to process that because there's too much texture and you wouldn't be able to lift something. Uh, if there's a nice surface that's smooth and clean, you can process that. So we talk with the detectives to see what area they think was touched, and then we go in as the expert and say, okay, I can process this item, I can process this item. Um, sometimes we look at something and we tell the detective, uh, this would be better for us to process back at the lab because there's more chemicals that we can use back there. And so they'll collect it and send it to the lab. What does it mean if a print is of comparison value? Uh, when we're looking at the latent prints, we're looking to see if we can find uh, the levels of details that I explained earlier, the level one, level two, and level three. Uh, is there ending ridges? Is there uh, dividing ridges? Uh, what's the clarity of the print? What's, uh, is there any distortion in the print? So we're looking at all this information to see whether or not there's even enough information to go forward with a comparison. And can movement of the finger affect the ability to have a print that's of comparison quality? Yes. And is that because of what you're describing, like with the doorknob as an example? Uh, yeah, if you touch something and you move, uh, your fingers can move along with it and, and they can distort in such a way that you may not be able to use that print for a comparison. Um, is it unusual in your experience to find pr no prints of comparison value even over a large area? No. It's not unusual? No. Um, once a fingerprint is lifted or photographed and compared to the known print, um, what findings might you make about it? Do you have categories that you put the prints into? Uh, yes, we do. Um, do you want me to tell you from what we do today or what we did back in 2006? Um, let's start with today. Today, we have, uh, we can individualize a print, so that means that the two prints uh, came from the same person. We can exclude the print, meaning the two prints did not come from the same person. Uh, we can call it incomplete, which means uh, we're doing a comparison, but Maybe we have rolled prints, but we need the tips of the fingers, or maybe we have a palm print, but we don't have a palm print from the person. So we need something in order to do that comparison, and we have inconclusive, which means that we have these two prints that lack agreement. There may be some consistency between the two, but there's not enough that we can individualize it, and there's not enough that we can exclude it. Okay. And then how about um, in LPC? What does that mean? Uh, that's a latent print card. Okay. Um, do you ever make a finding that there's no print of comparison value, meaning that it basically can't be compared to anything? Yes, we do. Okay. Now, in 2006, what was the difference? Um, in 2006, we could, um, we could do the incomplete. We could say, I need something more. Uh, we could say something was individualized, that, that, it would either, that it did match somebody. We could say something was excluded, meaning it didn't match somebody. Or we could say it had no value. Okay. Were you able to say that it was inconclusive? No. Okay. And today inconclusive <coughs> means what? And today inconclusive means that uh, according to our SOP, our standard operating procedures, today our inconclusive means it lacks agreement to be able to individualize or to exclude. Now, you talked a little bit about the points on a print. Um, are there a certain number of points that if you find them, that means it's a match? Does that apply anymore? I uh, know it does not. Um, were prints lifted or photographed in the case involving the death of Nicole Peets? Yes. And the um, 
Did you actually go out to either the scene where her body was found or to the car search? No, I did not. So what role did you have in the fingerprints? <coughs> uh, what role did you have in the fingerprints in this case? Um, there was two examiners that went out to process the car and then they gave me the, I believe they, I don't remember if they had lifts or not, um, but they, there was definitely film. So at the time we were taking 35 millimeter film and not digital pictures. So they gave me the film to look at to do the comparison. So I was the examiner on the case. I was comparing the fingerprints to the, the latent prints to the known prints. Were all the um, things that you got to compare photographs or were there some lifts as well? Um, I eventually got photographs and lifts. And do you remember who did the processing of the car? Um, Wade Petroka and Michael French. Once those things that had been taken the car, those prints that had been taken the car were sent to you, um, what did you compare them to? Um, the known prints or? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I compared them to known prints of um, uh, two people, Nicole Peets and I forget the other name, but also a Peets. Okay. Uh, could it be Martin David Peets? Yes. Thank you. Um, how did you come to get the prints of Nicole Peets? Um, I received them from the medical examiner's office. Okay, so have they been taken at autopsy? Yes. Can there be issues with prints that are taken at autopsy? Uh, yes, there can be. Okay, what are some of the issues that you found? Well, because the person has already died, they have started to decompose, and so their friction ridges can start to decompose along with them, so we don't have necessarily the full print to look at. Um, do you remember of all the items that you were sent, the uh, lifts or the photographs, how many were usable for comparison purposes? I don't remember offhand. There were several prints of value that were compared. Okay. Um, can you tell us where on the car were the usable lifts or photographs? Um, can I look at my notes? If that would refresh your memory, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yes. Okay, where, where on the car were usable prints? I'm going to take this out to make it a little bit easier for me. Let's see here. On There were prints of value on the driver's door handle. Okay. Um, there's actually two prints on the driver's door handle. Okay. There was a print on the interior rear passenger window. Okay. Uh, there was a print on the driver's side, oh, excuse me, um, the car. There was also a print on the gear shift. Okay. I think that's all that was on the car. Okay. How about on items in the car? Uh, there was prints on a flashlight, a plastic bottle, uh, there was a plastic bag, CD case, slug and mirror, I think that's the name of the CD case, slug and mirror. Okay. And there's one, two, three, three prints on that. There was five prints on a CD cover Atmo. Okay. And that's both on the front and the back of that CD cover. Uh, let's see here. There were x rays and there was. Uh, A 
11 prints of value on uh, an item called x-rays. Okay, let's start with the x-rays. Um, were you able to match the prints on the x-rays to either <coughs> David Peets or Nicole Peets? Um, I was able to identify nine prints to David Peets and no prints to Nicole. Okay. And how about on the CD cover, the Atmo? Uh, there was one print identified to David Keats. Any other prints on that one? Uh, not on the CD cover at no. no. How about on the CD case that you mentioned? Uh, the other one that has the name Slug and Mirror, mm -hmm. uh, there was two prints identified to an Ashley Ramirez. How about on the plastic bag? There was nothing um, identified on the plastic bag. So you found prints, but <coughs> they weren't. They weren't identified, no. How about on the plastic bottle? Uh, there was one print identified to David Peets. And on the flashlight? On the flashlight, there was no, nothing was identified. How about on the interior rear passenger window? Interior rear passenger window. Oh, there we go. Uh, nothing was identified to that print. Okay, let's talk about the driver's door handle. Um, now, actually, were there two door handles submitted to you? Uh, yes, there were. Okay. Now, uh, one was AAM76, yes. correct? And that's been identified as the interior driver door handle. Is okay. that your understanding? Yes. Okay. And then did you also receive AAM77? Yes. And what was that identified as? I would have to look. Let me think about this for a second. Okay. 77 was uh, not identified to anybody. Okay. Um, do we know where in the car 77 came from? Uh, it just says driver's door handle. That's what I have. Okay. So this is Exhibit 54. Do you remember when you examined it if there was a photograph or you were actually looking at the item? I was looking at a photograph. Okay. And that photograph would have been taken by the people who processed the car? Yes, I, I believe so. Okay. Do you know where on the door handle the photograph was taken that you looked at? I don't recall. Um, it might be on in, in the film negatives, but I would have to look at them to see if they took a picture of it before they photographed it. Um, what did you find when comparing, well, first of all, did you find a print of comparison value in that photograph? Uh, for which one? For the interior driver store handle. Is that AA76 or 77? 76. 76. Uh, 76, yes. There was one print of value, and it was identified to David Peets. Okay. And then 77, which is the other door handle. Did you find anything on that? No, that one was uh, not identified. talked also about a gear shift. Yes. <coughs> it's been entered into 
Evidences Exhibit 49. Did you examine a photograph or the actual object? A photograph. Okay. And where on the gear shift knob had the photograph been taken, do you know? On the silver portion, the button. So is it your understanding in the car the button would be pushed like so? Yes. To engage the gear. This first photo is in evidence as 51A already. Very difficult to see because it's so dark. Does that appear to be the gear shift in the car itself? Yes. Now 51B, what would something like that show? Why would there be a measure held up next to the gear shift knob? So that you could calibrate it because it's a photograph that's being taken. So you can make sure that you can calibrate it to make sure it's the right size. Now an item like this that has this sort of curved configuration, is that a difficult thing to make a lift off of or can it be? You can definitely make a lift off of that, yes. In certain situations, would it be advisable to take a photograph instead? Yes, depending on whether or not, how they process it. If they processed it with the cyanacrylate ester or super glue, they might want to just take a photograph of it. If they were going to try and preserve it for DNA, if we use the powders, the powders can be contaminated. So we might not use the powders on that until they've tried to preserve it for DNA first. So yeah, there's reasons why we would just photograph it and not lift it. Does the super glue process damage a print if it's sent for, well, let me back up. Does the super glue process damage something for purposes of DNA testing? No, we've worked with Washington State Patrol. They're allowed to make sure that the processes that we use when we're preserving for DNA are acceptable and they let us use super glue or cyanacrylate ester. If you actually lift a print, would that damage it for purposes of DNA testing? You might pull the print away or the DNA away from there. Okay. So in that situation, is it preferable to try to photograph it instead? Yeah, photograph it and then just leave it be. Okay. And then DNA testing can occur on it? Yes. Now, I'm going to show you photograph C, I should say for the record. The one we were just looking at was photograph B, 55B. It's not labeled. 55C, what is that? That's the print that was on the gear shift knob. Okay. Is that the photograph of it? That's the photograph of it, yes. Okay. Is it your understanding that that was taken during the car search by the processors? Yes. Okay. Is that the print picture that you worked off of when you were trying to see if it matched the known print? There were several prints taken of that, and I don't know if that's the exact one that I looked at, but I looked at all of the ones that were there to look for the one that had the best quality. Okay. And what did you come up with at that time when you were comparing it to the prints of the defendant? 
In 2006, when I was looking at this print, I called it no value because I couldn't individualize it and I couldn't exclude it. Okay. Let's explain that a little bit. When you say individualize, <coughs> what do you mean? When I say individualize, I mean, could I identify that print to a specific person and a specific finger? And at that time, I could not. What was missing? Uh, there was missing um, objective data and uh, clear detail. You said no individualization. What was the second thing? Oops. Uh, there was no exclusion made. Okay. And what would have allowed you to make an exclusion? Uh, there would have to have been enough disagreement between the two prints that I could exclude it as being made from that particular person and that particular finger. Okay. But I could not do that either. Okay. Did you see agreement between the two prints in any way? Uh, yes, I did. What did you see? Um, I saw that there was at least three different areas of touch in this print. Um, there was some detail in a lower portion that was consistent. There was some detail in an upper portion that was consistent. And there was some detail uh, with the way it is right now towards the bottom there that was consistent. But I couldn't link all three of those portions together. Okay. So when you talk about consistent, are you talking about consisting with the known print of the defendant? Yes. So you were not able to exclude him? I was not able to exclude him and I was not able to individualize him. Okay. Him. So I think you testified that you called it no value? Yes. Okay. Um, in 2006, you've talked about the policy that inconclusive was not an option. Um, looking at it in 2013, would you still call it no value, given your new policies? Uh, no, I would call it inconclusive. Okay. And the difference being? Um, the difference is it, it had the same information as before. There was some consistency. Um, there was some things that didn't quite line up, and I couldn't go from any of the three areas and link them together. Uh, there wasn't enough detail that I could individualize, uh, and there was too much information that was not lining up that I couldn't exclude it. Okay. Were you able to exclude anyone from that print? Uh, no. I mean, I didn't look at anybody else. Okay. Um, at some point, did this uh, item itself get sent for vacuum metal testing? I know many items did get tested for vacuum metal testing, and I'm not sure if this was one of them. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about what vacuum metal testing is? Um, it's a process where uh, there's a big chamber and they put the items in it and they pressurize it with, I, I usually, they used to use gold and then the gold would adhere to the residue. It's very similar to the super glue where the super glue has fumes that adheres, but this is uh, the pressure and the gold fume to the residue. Okay. Now, um, if it helps you to refer to your notes, could you please do so and see if you re-examined these after vacuum metal testing? Um, I know that this went, this came back to our office because they were going to try and re-photograph it because you can see in the one area there's kind of some hot spots on there. Um, and But at that point, uh, it had been swabbed for DNA. Okay. What are hot spots? What, what are Towards the uh, right-hand side, you can see the white spots mm -hmm. up a little higher. So there and then a little bit higher there. So we wanted to, I wanted them to re-photograph it to see if we could get some of that detail more clearly. Um, so there could be something more to add to that comparison. Um, but when they did that, that had been swapped clean from the DNA. Okay, so it had been sent to the lab and swapped. Yeah, so I don't know if it had then gone to vacuum metal deposition because it had already been swapped at that point. Okay. Um, so were you able to find anything in upon re-examination or was it obliterated? It was obliterated and they tried to re-superglue it to see if they could bring anything back and they could not. Okay. When DNA swabbing occurs, um, what is it that obliterates the print? Is it actually like taking it off? Uh, they use swabs where they rub it to get the DNA from it. Okay. And if something's been super glued, does that increase the amount of force that has to be used by the swab? Yes. Now, can you tell us, um, you talked about APHIS just briefly, but what is it exactly? Um, APHIS is our database. It's a computer system that has a lot of fingerprints in it. 
Um, as people are fingerprinted for various reasons, um, applicants, um, subjects in jail, uh, their prints are put into the database so that when we get latent prints, we can run them against all the prints that are in the database. database. And you see if any of the latent prints match somebody in the database? Yes. And did that happen in this case? Uh, were prints run in this case? Yes. Uh, yes, there were prints run in this case. Okay. And of the, the ones that weren't run, why were they not run? Uh, if a print wasn't run, either it was already individualized to a specific person or it did not have APHIS value. Okay, so it has to be a strong enough print to go into the system? Yes, and in 2006, the, the system that we had only ran the top portion of the finger. So if there was a palm print, it wouldn't have been run through the system either. Okay. Now, um, so the prints that were of comparison value that were run through APHIS, did they hit on anyone in that database? Um, they eventually hit on um, Ashley Ramirez. Okay, and that was on the CD case? Yes. Anyone else? No. on a few items. First of all, with regards to the door handles, you indicated that one, the driver's door handle, uh, one print came back to David Peets, correct? Yes. And the other print, what was the status of that? Um, it was excluded from David Peets. Okay. D was it, did it include anybody else? No, it did not. Okay. Did it, when you ran it through was there enough in it to send it into APHIS? Could you just check so we can have that clear? Um, no, it was not run through APHIS and it was not of APHIS value. Okay, so it was a partial print? Yes. Okay. Um, with regard to the CDs, you said that there was one, that the uh, Atmo had one print that matched David Peets, correct? So which one? The Atmo. Atmo. Uh, yes, it did. Okay. And were there other prints on that CD that you were able to compare? Uh, yes, I was. And what about those? Uh, on the Atmo, uh, there was there was one, two, three. There's three other prints. Um, they were excluded to David. And one was inconclusive, and one was inconclusive to Ashley Ramirez. Okay, I, I want to back up a little bit on the driver's door handle because I know this was divided into two parts, right? Yes. Okay, so there's 76, which was the driver's door handle. That's the one that matched the defendant. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and 77 is another driver's door handle. Yes. Correct, and um, that came out not matching anybody. Is that right? Or what was the status of that print? It did not match anybody. Okay. Was it a good print? Uh, yes, it was good enough to do a comparison. Okay. And with regard to the x-rays, you said that <coughs> there were nine that matched the defendant. Is that correct? Yes. And did any of them match Nicole Peets? Uh, no. Okay, what about the other two? Uh, no, they did not match. Uh, were the other two good prints for comparison? Yes. And did they include anybody? Uh, no, they did not. Okay, 
Thank you. I don't have any further questions. I just want to clarify um, a couple of things that you were discussing on direct examination. There were actually two prints that were obtained from the driver's side door handle that were of comparison value. Is that correct? Yes. You testified that one of those prints was individualized to David Peets, correct? Yes. The second one was also of comparison value. Yes. And that second print, you were able to exclude David Peets as the contributor of their fingerprint, correct? Yes. And when you did this comparison with this second print, that's print uh, evidence item uh, 77, AM 77, is that right? Yes. Uh, you were looking at a photograph of the print from the driver's side door handle, correct? Yes, I was. And you were comparing it to a... Uh, latent print uh, on a fingerprint card, or maybe I'm using the wrong term, a print, I, I think I did use the wrong term, uh, a print on a fingerprint card of David Peets, and you had all ten of his fingers, is that correct? Yes. Those were fingerprints that David Peets had provided uh, in the investigation in 2006, correct? I believe so, yes. And uh, those prints that he provided were all good prints for you to do this comparison, correct? Yes. And. Print number 77, again, when you look at your list of various categories for prints, this was of comparison value. Yes, it was. It was enough that you could make an individualization or make an exclusion, correct? Yes. And when you looked at AM77, you analyzed it in terms of all of your various levels of fingerprint analysis that you told us about, correct? Yes. This would be level one in terms of the loops and the whorls and the arches and the points, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and level two, we're talking about the ridges and the bifurcations and so forth. Yes. And when you did that analysis, you excluded David Peets as the contributor of that fingerprint. Yes, I did. And you were not able to identify anyone else in this investigation as having contributed that fingerprint to the driver's side door handle. I uh, No, I was not. But according to you, it wasn't a sufficient print to be able to run through the APHIS database. Uh, yes. That's the database that has uh, fingerprints from criminals and so forth that the state keeps. Uh, it has fingerprints from lots of people, not just criminals. But that's your database that you use to run a print through, correct? Yes. There was also a fingerprint on the interior rear passenger window that you were also ex able to exclude David Peets as the contributor of. Okay. Is that true? I would have to look at my notes, but I think so. Okay. Yes. Um, feel free to look at your notes if you want. Interior passenger window? Uh, interior rear passenger window. Okay. Yes. Is that right? Yes, I excluded Pete, uh, David Peets. Again, that fingerprint was uh, had sufficient detail to be, for your purposes, of comparison value. Yes. And again, when you analyzed the various levels of detail for David Peets, uh, you did not see that detail, and you were able to exclude him as being the contributor of that fingerprint, correct? Yes. With respect to the fingerprint on the interior rear passenger window, you were not able to identify that to anybody else in this investigation? Uh, no, I have notes on here that it's incomplete to Ashley Ramirez and then also to Nicole Peets. 
Incomplete. Incomplete. I needed something more. Okay. You were not able to make an identification though, for anyone else. But I couldn't exclude them either. You testified about finding some fingerprints on some other items in the on the evidence items from the Jetta that were David Pete's, uh, for instance, on some CD cases and so forth. Yes. Um, there wasn't there also a fingerprint of David Pete's on a plastic bottle that was in the. Yes. Jetta, and that, that plastic bottle was in the Jetta. Is that right? I have no knowledge of where the plastic bottle came from. I wasn't at the crime scene. Okay, but you were able to find David Pete's fingerprint on it. Yes. Well, Ms. Zeller, um, you're employed by the King County Sheriff's yeah. Office. Is that correct? Yes. And with your respect to your opinion on the latent print on the gear shift. Your opinion is that you can't exclude David Peets, correct? Yes. Now, when you do your analysis, as I think you testified on direct examination, there's no certain required number of points of comparison that you have to find to include or exclude or so forth. No, there's not. Uh, basically, well, let me back up for a second. When you do the comparison, uh, you're not using any type of uh, specialized equipment to do the analysis, is that right? Well, we're using magnification. We have good lighting. We also have Adobe Photoshop where we can scan the prints into the Adobe, bring it up even larger than our magnification on our desk. Uh, so I guess that's specialized equipment. But, in, but that's just to improve your ability to see the, the photograph and the print, correct? Yes. When you're doing the analysis and looking at the whorls and the ridges and so forth, you're just looking at it with your own two eyes and comparing them. Well, your own two eyes with the magnification, so yes. Right. But it's just, in terms of doing the comparison, it's you looking at one and comparing it to the other and then basically making a judgment call as to where it falls in the various categories. Yes and no. We're looking at all the objective data, and there's no specific number of points because points aren't the only thing we're looking at. Points are level two detail, but there's also level three detail. So, and those don't have a number given to them. So, I mean, there's more than just points that we're looking at. We're looking at all the detail in the print. It's a kind of a holistic thing. We're looking at the ridge flow. We're looking at whether or not there's ending ridges, dividing ridges. We're looking at whether or not we can see incipients. Can we see the pores? Is there ridge shapes that we can see? on those ridges. Uh, so we're looking at all that information. Um, and so then I have to have that objective data and I have to come to a, a conclusion. And it has to be justifiable. I have to be able to show somebody else, this is what I was looking at to make that determination. And then it has to go through um, consensus. So the other people in the office can look at this. It's always open for scrutiny. So somebody else can come along and scrutinize <laughs> it later and see, did you make the proper conclusion? Did you have enough justification for what you said? So it's not just me making a judgment call. There's a lot more that goes into it than that. But ultimately, when you categorize it, it's, it's you or whoever else is looking at it deciding what category it falls in. I, yes, and it has to meet the scrutiny of others. And you would agree, um, I guess as you just indicated, that um, different fingerprint examiners might be able to reach different conclusions comparing the same two <coughs> prints. It's possible. You'd have to look at what their policies were for where they were working, what they were looking at. They would also have to justify what they came up with. How did they come up with their conclusion? So you'd have to have them explain to you, well, this is why I came up with something different. Going back to your opinion that you can't exclude David Peets as the contributor of this fingerprint on the gear shift. Um, you can't put some kind of statistical figure on how many other people could have contributed this particular fingerprint, can you? No, I can't. Fingerprint analysis in this respect is unlike, for example, DNA science, where uh, you may have heard uh, DNA examiners can say, well, uh, it, you know, this DNA sample is, you know, one in a 500 million or something like that. You, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Okay. Fingerprints is very different than that. You can't say, uh, well, there's only, you know, so many people in the whole world who could have contributed this, this partial fingerprint. 
Uh, right now they're working on statistical probabilities, but they have not been able to come to a conclusion or there's nothing been validated or that shows that any statistical probability will do any good at all. So they're working on it, but it's not there. So right now, it, it, no, there's no statistical probabilities that can be used. So going back to our case, with respect to this fingerprint on the gear shift button, you can't say how many other people could have left that print. Uh, no, I can't. And the print on the gear shift button was also not individualized to Nicole Peets. Uh, no, it was not. If I may have a Ms. Zeller, um, you're aware that these prints that you were looking at were taken from a Jetta car that was owned by Nicole and David Peets, correct? Uh, yes, I do believe I knew that. Okay. If we assume that Nicole Peets drove this particular Jetta car the day before it disappeared, you would expect to see her fingerprints on the surface, sur various surfaces in the car that the driver would have to use, wouldn't you? Well, again, back to the factors that we talked about earlier, you may or may not leave an impression behind. It's a chance impression. Um, I've processed entire cars and not gotten anything from anybody. So would I expect there to be a print? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, it's a chance impression. So I can't say that, yes, I would expect there to be something there. Because in this case, you didn't find any of Nicole's prints in the kind of driver's area where the driver would touch, correct? Uh, we did not locate her prints, but we also, I had them, a lot of them were incomplete because uh, the prints came from the Emmy's office and they were not the best quality prints. So I couldn't, a lot of them I couldn't exclude her prints, but I, they were just incomplete. I needed something better. Uh, but as you say, there are a number of factors that can play into whether you get prints of any usable value. Uh, yes, in the object that we're processing, there's lots of factors involved. Some cases you uh, are able to get a lot of prints and it has a significant evidentiary value in a particular case. Uh, probably, yes. In some cases, you might have a lot of potential prints and you look at them and it just turns out not to answer any of the questions in the case. Uh, probably. I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. Anything else you say? Um, Ms. Zeller, I want to clarify something. <coughs> that deals with the door handle. Now, I know in your report, I think you reference it as door handle, right? Yes. Okay, and there's two of them. There's AAM76 and AAM77. Yes. Correct? And AAM76 is the one where you found the defendant's fingerprint. Yes. Okay. And AAM77 is the one where you found an inconclusive print. Uh, excluded. Excluded him, right. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's been marked State's Exhibit 56. Does that purport to be one of the door handles from the car? Yes, it does. Okay. And which door handle does it purport to be? Uh, left rear passenger door handle. 
AAM 77. Okay. So 76 that matched the defendant is the front driver's door, and 77 that excluded him is the rear passenger door. Is that correct? According to this, yes. I also wanted to clarify on some of the ones that we talked about on direct, we talked about there being uh, no identifications. Yes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there weren't some pieces that included or excluded people, right? Yes. Okay. So um, with regard to the plastic bag, I think you testified that there was no identification, but can we get a little more specific than that? Plastic bag. Um, so what would you like to know? I uh, excluded Ashley Ramirez from the plastic bag. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the results here for Nicole Peets. So I'd have to look on a different piece of paper. Okay, could you do that? I just don't want to create a false impression that there was some random print on the plastic bag. Try 8C to start. 8C, um, that one was individualized. To the defendant? Yes. That's the plastic bottle. Yes. And 8A is the flashlight? Yes. And what did that show? Um, at this time, it was incomplete to both. Okay. Both the defendant and Nicole? Yes. Okay. And with regard to the plastic bag, which would be, uh, looks like K and N. Yes, K and N, they uh, were both negative or excluded to uh, David Peets and incomplete to Nicole Peets. Okay. And with regard to the x-rays, um, you said that nine matched the defendant. Were the others of comparison quality? Here. There was a couple that were comparison quality. There was two additional ones that were comparison quality. Okay, and which ones are you referencing? Uh, CLZ 11, C, and D. Okay. And those are ones that came up with what? They were excluded to David Beats, and they were incomplete to Nicole Peets. Now, in your experience, Ms. Zeller, years of experience, is it unusual to find prints from multiple different people in a car? It's not unusual, no. And finally, I, I don't think that I asked you, on the gear shift itself, were you able to exclude the defendant from making that print? On the gear shift, no, I was not able to exclude him. Thank you. I have nothing else. Ms. Zeller, I just want to clarify. There was, uh, the state was asking you about AM77, which, I guess you testified was, perhaps if I could just take a look at it, it was a left rear passenger door handle, correct? Um, perhaps I, I was mixing up the evidence items a bit. If we exclude that for a second, th there was an unidentified print on there that could be, uh, that you could exclude David Peets from, correct? Yes. Okay. Let's put that aside for a second. Let's go back to the front driver's door handle. Yes. Um, there was an additional print on the front driver's door handle that you could exclude David Peets <coughs> from being the contributor of, wasn't there? I don't think so. I think there was just the one print, and that's AA 
76. AAM 76. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Ms. Zeller, I'm handing you... Oh, I'm going to check this part first. Excuse me. Ms. Zeller, I'm handing you what's been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 57 for identification. Yes. Do you recognize what this is? Yes, I do. Are these your latent lab comparison results for this case? Yes, it is. All right. And are these notes that you use to document your findings with respect to comparison of fingerprints for various evidence items? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. If you could flip to the last page, which has a page number in the bottom right-hand corner that says MDP 4311, do you see that? Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Could you review that page and let me know if that refreshes your recollection as to whether or not you found a second print on the driver's door handle that was negative for David Peets? According to this, yes, there was one print that was negative. Okay. So, in summary, there were two prints found on the driver's door handle, correct? Yes, there was. One of them was identified to David Peets. Is that right? Yes, according to this. And I'd like to look at the negative sheet to make sure that this is correct, if that would be possible, in the film. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. Ms. Zeller, I'm handing you what's been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 58. Do you recognize this? Yes, I do. Is this the negative sheet? Yes, it is. Of the photographs of the prints on the driver's door handle? Yes, it is. That you used in this case? Yes. And does this reflect that there were photographs of two different prints taken from the driver's door handle? Yes, it does. One photograph is photograph A, and the other photograph is photograph B, correct? Yes. Photograph B, print number B, is the one that was identified to Martin David Peets, correct? Yes. Photograph A is a print that was not identified to Martin Peets, correct? Yes. And if you look back on page 4311 that we were just looking at, in fact, you wrote for photograph A on the driver's door handle, negative, Martin Peets. Yes, I did. And weren't these prints actually run through APHIS, these print photos? I don't remember at this time. Let me take a look here, see if I can. This time, at that point, they were not. No, 
No, they were not run through APHIS. Okay. Even at a later point, though, you said that there was a hit with an Ashley Ramirez later? Uh, yes, that was on a different print altogether. Okay, you didn't run these particular prints. Um, if I didn't run it, it was because it wasn't quality for our APHIS system. Yes, they are. All right. And 76 has been identified as the interior driver door handle. Yes, it has. Okay. That's the one that had David Pizza's fingerprint on it. Yes. Correct? And I think when you got them, you renumbered them A and B, correct? Yes, I did. As opposed to separate numbers. Um, and 77 is identified as the rear passenger door. Yes, it is. Okay. And you called it driver's door handle. Is that necessarily inconsistent? Could it have been the rear passenger door on the driver's side? I'd have to look at the, I'm sorry, I'd have to look at the photographic, uh, the photographic log, the photo log. Do you have that handy? Yes, it should be in here. Okay. Hopefully quickly. According to the photo log, uh, there was three photographs taken. Uh, the first one was AA, A, well, they have it listed as AMM76. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, and they just, that's all it says. That one was not of value. Then they have one that they say is AMM77, which they say is the inner handle. So it says the inner handle. And then the third one, which would be, so that, that one I just said was A, A, M77, um, which is A, M, I, C, L, Z, A. And then the third one they say is A, A, M76, uh, which was the B. Okay, and that's the driver's door handle. You can't tell. Okay. Not from here. From okay. here it just says A, A, M76. Okay. Then to say what it that's fine. To do. Would you tend to rely on the labeling from the actual detective who packaged the evidence? Yes. Okay. Let me ask you one other thing with regard to the rear driver's door handle um, that you said excluded Martin Pete. Was it incomplete as to anyone else? And that would be CLZ two. Uh, two two A two, two A A M seventy seven. That would be two A was incomplete to Nicole Peets. Okay, so it excluded Martin Peets and was incomplete to Nicole. Yes. Based on the packaging, that was the rear door handle. Just for based clarity. On the, yes, based okay. on the packaging. And AAM seventy six 
was the front driver's door handle, and that's the one that had the defendant's print on it. Yes. No, no, okay, sorry. Thank you. The I'm sorry. AAM76 <coughs> was the front door handle. Yes. That you individualized to the defendant. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Nothing else. Ms. Zeller, going back to the negative sheet that you and I were looking at a minute ago. Yes. That's the one where you list the two photos, A and B. Yes, I did. Okay. B is the one that could be you individualized to David Peets. A is the one that you were able to exclude to David Peets. Yes. On that negative sheet, you just wrote driver's door handle, correct? I did. And you didn't list multiple handles throughout the car, and you didn't say anything about a rear passenger or rear driver's door handle. No. Back in 2006, we only labeled the prints that were of value. And up at the top, there's another set of prints up there. And according to the photo sheet, that first set was, I can't remember now, the first set was AAM76, then A, which is the print that I was of value, was AAM77, and then the third print again was AAM76, according to the photo log itself. And I could have just misread this or something, assuming that the prints were going to be the same and not 76, 77, 76. Okay. And even regardless of whether this was from the front or the back door handle, it was a print that you could exclude David Peets as being the contributor of, correct? Yes. And you could not individualize it to anyone else in this investigation? No, I did not individualize it to anyone else. Nothing further, Your Honor. So you found it incomplete as to the goal? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Nothing else. You may step down. Thank you. Yeah, make sure you don't have anything that he wants to contribute. We'll take a morning recess. Thank you. Thank you.